back with you. I'd like to talk again today about differential equations. Now, the previous video was an introduction to differential equations and why they're maybe not so scary. Well, that video seemed to go over pretty well, so let's, let's take the next step together. Now, in case you don't remember from the last video, or maybe we're a little fuzzy, a differential equation is just an equation that has a slope in it. Now, it could be a slope of the independent or the dependent variable, but it's just a slope. And because it's got a slope, the solution to a differential equation is a function, not a number. So those are the big ideas. And a differential equation, the one I used last time, and the one we've certainly all seen, is F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. This is Newton's law. Newton wrote this down uh, 300 years ago or so. Except he didn't really write it that way. He wrote it this way. Yeah, well, he didn't write it using exactly this notation, but this is what he wrote. Another way to write this using slightly different notation, second derivative of x with respect to time, looks just like that. Those are equivalent statements. Well, that's a differential equation. It's actually got a slope of a slope. It's a second derivative, so it's a curvature, really. Um, but that's a differential equation, and, and Newton intended it to be a differential equation because he knew that uh, force was not going to be constant. He was looking at the acceleration, or I'm sorry, the force, well, like the acceleration, force between the sun and planets. And since planets travel in ellipses, the distance between the planet and the sun is always changing. The force is a function of distance, so the force is always changing. You get this continuous change. Well, you, this isn't going to work anymore. M and A can't be just numbers. One of them, at least, has to be a function. That's where this came from. Okay, now when you start learning about differential equations, you're going to find out there's all kinds of terminology involved. That's what I'd like to help you sort out right now. What does all this terminology mean, and how do you make sense of the, of the structure? Well, the first thing let's talk about is whether you've got what's called an ordinary or partial differential equation. Now, when I become king of the world, I may change those names, but until then, we're kind of stuck with them. So an ordinary differential equation, uh, and to keep it quick here, I'm going to write it as diffy q. You hear about diffy q's a lot. That's kind of the slang or the, the shorthand for a differential equation. You'll also see this called an ODE. That's a, another uh, abbreviation you sometimes have. That has one independent variable. Okay, now just in case you don't remember, the difference between an independent and a dependent variable is that an independent variable can change however it wants. The dependent variable is a function of the independent variable and can't change, cannot change however it wants. So the equation I wrote down last time, which is actually probably as good as anything for right now, is that. Okay, this is a, what, what's, what is a function that is its own uh, derivative? So. Uh, find me a function where the slope of the function is the same of the fun as the function. And what we found out was that uh, y of x, whoops, let me try this one more time, y of x equals e to the x. Right? That's a function that is its own derivative. What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. What's the derivative of that? e to the x. So the derivative of y to the x is the same as y to the x. That's the solution to that. Now, to plot that out, looks like this. And there's my initial condition, remember from last time, that was y equals 1 when x equals 0. And the curve looks like this. Okay, down here, this is the independent variable. This can change however it wants. This is the dependent variable. It can't change however it wants. It's dependent on y, and the relationship is right there. So for an ordinary differential equation, you've got a function of one variable. You can have, only have a slope with respect to one independent variable. And that's called, for reasons I probably should know but don't, an ordinary differential equation. Well, the next distinction we make is what's something called a partial differential equation. Partial differential equation, sometimes they call that a PDE, and that means it's got several or more than one independent variables. More than one independent variable. Well, a function can have more than one independent variable. Imagine I did this. Imagine I drew a set of axes where that was x, y, and z. And I, okay, so I've got now x, y, and z. This is, these two axes here are perpendicular to each other, and that's perpendicular to each other. 
and so is this one. So this is three orthogonal axes. We, we deal with this all the time. Well, imagine I have, let's see if I can sketch this quickly. Imagine I have a surface there that's, I can draw, boy, this is getting tough now, there. And I've got some function that lies along that surface. That surface right there, and it's, it's the way I've got it drawn, it's almost a plane, but um, what I intend is it for, to, for it to be a uh, dip in the middle a little bit. But if I know what x and y are, I know what z is. That's okay. What that gives me is a function that z is the function. z is a function of x and y. Right? We see stuff like this all the time, right? Well, if there's such a thing as a function of more than one variable, Think about it. Think about the temperature in this room. I've got lights over here and lights over here and lights up there and I've got a computer over there. Down here I've got a little baby refrigerator. Depending on where you are in this room, you get a different temperature. That doesn't vary much, but a little bit maybe, a couple degrees perhaps. If we were to develop a function, an approximate function maybe, for temperature in this room, it would be a function of x, y, and z. I don't know about you, I live in three space. I live in, in, a, in a space with three spatial dimensions. So any place I go in this room, there's going to be a temperature. In order to calculate that temperature, I need to know where I am in all three dimensions. Another example of a function with three independent variables and one dependent variable. The independent variables being x, y, and z. The dependent variable being the time. Well, it's not too hard to imagine a physical situation in which a slope is important. Okay. If you deal with electromagnetism problems, or you deal with stress problems in solid bodies, or uh, special relativity, or fluid flow, or all kinds of other things, acoustics, there are differential equations that are in space, and sometimes in space and time. If you have a differential equation in space describing something that varies with time, you're going to have four independent variables, x, y, z, and t. Okay? That's pretty common. Right. In order to do that, you're going to have to write down something called a partial differential equation. All that means, the only difference between an ordinary and a partial differential equation is how many independent variables you got. If you got one, it's an ODE. If you got more than one, PDE. If you want to see an example, there's a, uh, I'll write this down here, 2y uh, partial x squared equals c partial squared y. Okay, there's one right there. That's a very badly written T. Okay? There's an example, and if I, if I wrote this down right, I'm digging this up from memory, I think that's the 1D wave equation. I'll have to go back and check. Um, I think I got that right. And uh, C is just some constant. Well, this is a, a function of both space and time, where I've got Y being uh, uh, the dependent variable, and X and T being the independent variable. This happens to describe the vibration of a string. Okay, a stretch string, like maybe a guitar string or piano string. Well, the position, uh, the vertical displacement of the string, let's say it's vibrating vertically, it's a function of where I am along the string and also the time. So there's x is where I am along the string, t is the time, and y is the vertical displacement of the string. This is a very, very common equation in the, in the world of physics. There is the 1D, which I've gotten written down here, but there's also 2 and 3D wave equations. Those get solved all the time, too. The difference, the, the way you uh, recognize the difference between a partial differential equation and an ordinary differential equation is the, the derivative. When I wrote an ordinary differential equation, I used a D, an actual you know, Latin letter D. Partials, there's this character here that looks like a backward six. All right? I'm sure it's got some name, but that, it looks to me like a backward six. And that's your indication that, when you see that backward six, this partial sign, that you're dealing with a derivative that, that uh, could include more than one independent variable. Mathematicians like to be very, very precise and very compact. They like to communicate as much information as possible as compactly as possible. So when you see that partial sign instead of a D, that's the mathematician's way of telling you, okay, you've got more than one independent variable now. This is now a partial differential equation, not an ordinary differential equation. So there you go. That's the first big distinction, partial or ordinary. In general, partial differential equations are harder to solve than ordinary differential equations because they've got more independent variables. The next uh, distinction we want to make is linear or nonlinear. OK? 
Okay? Linear differential equations look like this. They've got, I'm going to call this, uh, let's see, I'll, let's, let's make the independent variable be time and the dependent variable be maybe y. Okay? So let's see, and I'll call this dNy dt to the n plus, let's see, you call that a n, plus a to the n minus 1 of t dn minus 1 of y tn minus 1 and so on and that's going to equal some function of t okay we get all the way down to zero down there in fact let's put that down here and let's see they'll call that a maybe zero of t and then y of t Okay, now this looks pretty gnarly to write all this down, and I don't mean this to be scary. Neither did the, the people who invented this notation didn't mean it to be scary. They meant it to be informative. Okay, t is my independent variable, okay? And y is my dependent variable. So that means y is a function of t. Now, I don't always have it written down here because I don't want this to get too, uh, too cumbersome. But I've got functions of my independent variable multiplied by derivatives of my dependent variable. And this happens to be the zero derivative here. This is the function itself. And that's just some function of my independent variable. This is like a forcing function if you want to think of it that way. That's a linear equation. So it's, this is pretty general. But let's think about the things it doesn't have in it. It doesn't have my derivative raised to any power. It doesn't have the function, the, the dependent variable y raised to any power, and it also doesn't have the dependent variable multiplied by a derivative. It doesn't have any of those three things, and because of that, it's called a linear equation. So a nonlinear differential equation is pretty much anything else. Okay? If you've got the, the function itself, the, the dependent variable raised to a power, okay, that's not linear. If you've got a derivative of the dependent variable, a slope or a curvature or whatever, raised to a power, not a linear equation. If you've got the function multiplied by a derivative, not a, a linear equation. Okay, well, not too surprisingly, uh, nonlinear equations are typically harder to solve than linear equations. So that's the next dis uh, distinction here. Uh, we'll get out of your way one more time if you want to see, get a screenshot of that. The last distinction we're going to make here, and I guess I can get rid of that while I'm at it here, is boundary value versus initial value problem. Okay? Well, that's, that's a little less clear to, when you hear it. To me, this is the one set of terminology that made more sense than the others. boundary value, I guess I'll call this a boundary value problem, an initial value problem, to be, I guess, strictly correct. All right, an initial value problem is one like uh, the, the one I originally wrote down, where we have the slope of the function equals the function. I gave you a starting point, y of 0 equals 1. All right? Now, there's going to have to be one piece of information given for every order of derivative, so that if I have uh, this function right here, whoops, fix that, there we go. All right, in order to solve a differential equation, remember you're trying to find a function that uh, uh, makes this uh, equation true, makes this statement true. And that's a derivative there. Well, the only way I know how to get rid of a derivative is to do an integral. Every time I do an integral, I'm going to have a constant of integration. Well, unless I know what that constant is, all I've really done is define a family of functions that haven't actually defined a specific one. So, if I can get one piece of information like y of 0 equals 1, that says this gives me a family of functions, but the function I want has to go through that point. Well, there's only one that does that. That's how I go from a family of functions really an infinitude of functions, down to one very specific one. All right. Now, this is at y of 0 equals 1. That's the beginning of the plot I drew earlier, where x gets bigger toward the right and y gets bigger vertically. I'm starting here. I'm going across. 
That's the starting point. I go this way. This is called an initial value problem. That's the initial value. If you want to think physically of what an initial value problem might be, imagine throwing a ball, say you have a baseball or a cricket ball or something, and you throw it. Well, as soon as it leaves your hand, you're done. There's nothing else you can do to affect the trajectory of that ball. Isaac Newton's doing the driving after that. That's a great uh, example of an initial value problem. All right? The physics that describe how the ball goes through the air are described by a differential equation. And once you know the initial point where the ball was released from your hand, its velocity and its angle, that's it. There's, no, there's nothing more to know about that trajectory. You can calculate, if you're careful enough and include enough effects, you can calculate pretty much exactly where that ball's going to hit. All right? Initial value problem. A boundary value problem is one where you know something about where the curve starts and where the curve ends. And I guess the, a good example of that is let's take a vibrating string, okay? Let's say you've got a, uh, a fixed point here and you've got a tension on this string and actually uh, I'm assuming the string has maybe a little roller or something. It can go ac across that, uh, that support there and a little roller there and the tension there, but it doesn't slide back and forth. It's, it's, it's fixed here. So in fact, let's do it this way. Let's put a tension there and I really will just pin it right there. So the tension in this string is T. Well, if I were to pluck this string and let it vibrate and then take a picture of it with a strobe light so I could freeze its motion, let's say I did this exactly right and there was a point in time where the position of that string, frozen in time, looks just like that. It turns out that's actually not that hard to do and it turns out this probably corresponds to the physics pretty well. Well, whatever else is going on with that string, I know what that position is. Okay, if this is, uh, where's my pencil? There we go. If this is the y direction here, and this is the x direction going that way, I know that at x equals 0, y equals 0. And if that's the length of the string, okay, I know that at y equals, or at x equals l, y equals 0. I know exactly what the, the, the position of the string is here and here. Those are the boundary values. That's a boundary value problem. And there's lots and lots and lots of interesting boundary value problems out there. Now, which one of them is hard to solve? Uh, it depends. Often those are harder to solve. So if you've been adding this up, the hardest problems to solve are typically nonlinear, uh, partial differential boundary value problems. That's, that's pretty much the, the top. I don't know of anything harder than that. Maybe there is. Or uh, more cumbersome to solve. So in the world I came out of, that might be a, a structural dynamics problem, or it might be a, uh, an aerodynamics problem. Right? But there's plenty of others. So there you go. We've, we've, we've talked a little bit about what differential equations do, and we've talked about the distinctions between them. So just to go over it one more time, the distinctions are, is it an ordinary differential equation or a partial differential equation? Well, partial differential equations have... Uh, more than one independent variable, and ordinary differential equations only have one. Is it linear or nonlinear? Okay, that you have to look at the form of the differential equation and decide. But if it's linear, there's one set of solution methods you use, and if it's nonlinear, there's another. And the last one is it an initial value problem or a boundary value problem? Once you can answer those three questions, you, you've got a real good start to figuring out how to solve the differential equation. This has been kind of a long video. I'll try to keep them shorter after this if I can. Um, next video we'll talk about how to actually solve these things, how to go from this just sort of general description to actually writing down solutions. I hope this helps and I'll see you next time.